Uh, I hope you will all join me in welcoming President John Williams. All right. Thanks, Stacey. Um, and uh, this has been a great uh, conference so far. I've really enjoyed the panels. I'm looking forward to the, the rest of the day. And I'm, I'm so pleased and honored to be able to speak at this event commemorating the Research and Statistics Centennial. As Stacey mentioned, I started my career here in my first seven and a half years here in RNS in the Max Group. It's great to see so many friends, colleagues, and especially the many mentors who have had such an impact on this institution and on me uh, personally. When you think about coming out of graduate school, starting your career, um, and as, as I did and many people in this room did here at the Fed, uh, it was a, a remarkable time. It was clearly a time that we're making connections and friendships and co-authorship uh, with people that have continued for decades since. But also, as was mentioned earlier, uh, the collaborative spirit is just really something that I valued. I got to work with a lot of different people on different projects, whether research or FOMC related or whatever, learning a lot from others and working with one mission. And it's something that I've brought with me, just like many in the, everybody in this room, as I've gone to the San Francisco Fed and the New York Fed, it's just something that I feel is so important uh, that we all have the same mission in the Federal Reserve. We do different parts of that work uh, and collaboration is, is maybe our superpower. Now, one thing that I, I was talking and thinking about mentors, and, and Dave Stockton's in there, so this is my Dave Stockton story. So when I interviewed um, at the board uh, in the flyout, so uh, RNS and IF uh, flew me out. I had great interviews, um, you know, got to talk about my research, got to meet really great economists, both, you know, you know new research economists, people who have been here a long time. And it was, I was really excited, and I was thinking, well, I hope I get a job offer. And, and uh, for reasons I don't know, Mike Prell wasn't around, but Dave uh, met with me and said, you know, this was the, this was the interview with the, you know, the, the top person. And, and, and Dave says to me, and I quote, you know, your research is, is interesting. I'm hearing good things about you. Um, but it's very theoretical. And I was doing research on endogenous growth. Remember, early 90s is a very big uh, topic. And, and he said, you know, your work is very theoretical. If you want to be successful at the Federal Reserve Board, you've got to bring an empirical part of that uh, to, to your work. You've really got to get your hands dirty and work with the data. Uh, how do you think about that? And I realized this was a critical point in my career, and it was. Like, there was a right answer, and there was a wrong answer. And I sat there, and it took me one millisecond to realize that the answer I gave, which I'm sure you do not remember, was, Dave, the thing that's been most frustrating and disappointing throughout my time at Stanford is I haven't had the ability to really do empirical work and get my hands dirty, because that's what I'm committed to doing. So. Now, I give, you know, I try to think when I think of the mentors who, went, whoops, many in, in this room and, and others, I always think, well, how do I carry that forward and mentor others? I always tell the, the Dave Stockton story, and I said, you know, when you're interviewing for a job, there is a right answer and a wrong answer, <laughs> and think about that. So, uh, so research and statistics, obviously known as RNS by everybody, is almost as old as the Federal Reserve. We heard about the 100 years. Uh, you know, and, and, and uh, Chair Powell's comments we heard about in, uh, earlier uh, in the panel. Uh, and it's made its, you know, RNS has made its mark here at the Federal Reserve, and is, I, think da I think David Wilcox made this point, it's beyond just the Federal Reserve. I think the work of RNS and the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve has uh, reaches across countries, uh, central banks around the world. I see that uh, in my work, uh, the BIS. And that's been true uh, for the past century and continues to be true today. It's a testament uh, to the leadership the high professional standards and the dedication to the Federal Reserve's mission that's ingrained in everybody who works, in generations of people who work in RNS. Now, other speakers have already covered other aspects of the Fed's his, uh, RNS's history and the various roles that uh, RNS is involved in um, for the past century. So, I'm going to focus my remarks on one specific topic, uh, and, and that's really the past 30 years. Uh, it, of course, corresponds to my own time uh, as a researcher and a policymaker at the Fed, first as a member of the staff of RNS for the first seven years, 
been, uh, as a consumer, uh, and an active consumer uh, of RNS products uh, while the San Francisco and the New York Feds. And the theme of, of my remarks is really, uh, can be summarized in this way. Over the past 30 years, the theory and practice of monetary policy has changed dramatically. Equally striking, though, is the ways that that transformation has influenced the research and analysis done by RNS and other divisions, but today's a celebration of RNS, so I'm going to focus on that. And the ways that the work of the economists and RNS has in turn shaped and influenced monetary policy. Before I go any further, I have to give the usual disclaimer. The views are my own, do not necessarily reflect those of the Federal Open Market Committee or others in the Federal Reserve System. So to get a full appreciation of all that's happened in the past 30 years, I want to take you back to 1993. On a personal note, that was when I first interviewed, that first initial interview you do as an economist, for a job at the board as a wet behind the ears 31-year-old grad student. And if my memory serves me well, and Steve doesn't uh, contradict this, I believe Steve Sharp was one of the economists who interviewed me in Stanford uh, back then, late uh, in 1993. From the perspective, so there's some, you know, there's a bunch of people who have to answer for some of their parts of this. Dave hiring me, Steve interviewing me, others. Um, uh, Governor Meyer for pushing us to do our uh, work on our star. Uh, but from the perspective of monetary policy, 1993 seems like a wor really a world away. Okay, so the Fed's balance sheet in 1993 was $400 billion. Today it's $8 trillion, nearly $8 trillion. And so many things that we take for granted weren't even a thing back then. So there were no FOMC statements, no press conferences, no dot plots, no longer run forecasts in the SEP, no policy rules, optimal control, or flexible inflation targeting. In fact, there was no inflation target at all. There was no QE, there was no QT, no LSAPs, no forward guidance, whether Odyssean or Delphic, no ZLB, ELB, or shadow rates, no ample or abundant reserves, no IRB, ONRP, or SOFR, no DSGE, EDO, or Sigma, no Furbis mall, which is hard to believe. And most shocking of all, no R star. <laughs> so reading through this extensive list, I admit that I have some sympathy for why central bankers occasionally pine for the simpler times of yesteryear, except for the R star part. Okay, but change was already afoot. And so I'll start with uh, one development that I think in important ways connects uh, a number of changes. And that is the, the birth of the famous Taylor Rule in 1993 when John Taylor wrote his paper, Discretion Versus Policy Rules and Practice. Of course, that was an outgrowth of a lot of years of research, including by Fed economists, about thinking about monetary policy rules and strategies. But to me, that paper galvanized uh, in many ways, how people uh, would start to think about monetary policy differently. Specifically, instead of approaching monetary policy as a one-time tactical decision as to whether rates should be a little higher, lower, or stay the same, the Taylor Rule identified or laid out an overall strategy for setting interest rates in, in any circumstances in terms of a reaction function. And it spawned research on a vast collection of monetary policy rules and optimal co control policies, that many of which, mu much of that research was developed here uh, and throughout the Fed's uh, system. And the Taylor Rule transformed policy research. The idea was simple. It had been around for a while. But I think it, it's, it's, it transformed it because it changed the language of talking about monetary policy. Uh, we moved away from thinking about impulse response functions to thinking about longer term issues. That includes what are effective monetary policy strategies, the trade-offs between our policy goals, the effects of the zero lower bound, as, as was discussed earlier, and of course, the roles of the various star variables, the inflation target, potential output, the neutral interest rate, or R star, that all appear in any policy rule. And so the Taylor Rule not only altered the way monetary policy is conceptualized, it also changed the way a lot of the research in RNS and other research divisions approach questions related to the economic outlook and thinking about policy alternatives. Now, the Fed, the wheels of change may sometimes turn slowly, but the, I think the Taylor Rule helped get those wheels spinning. Now, a second transformative change in the past 30 years was the development of large-scale macroeconomic models designed to study a lot of these longer-run issues. 
Um, earlier macro models were often used primarily for short-term forecasting and analysis, which is very important, of course. I'm not saying that's not important, and that continues. But the new models and the new generation of models allowed researchers to explore the longer-run questions related to policy strategy, importantly, using empirically founded models. And to my mind, the FURBIS model in RNS and the FRB Global model in the International Finance Division represented a watershed moment in the early 90s, of course, supplementing the other models that were used at the board. Of course, later, a generation of DSG models were added to the stable of tools for analysis and included the ETO model in RNS and Sigma International Finance. So far, I've highlighted developments underway in economics in the early 90s, but there's also a transformation underway in monetary policy making with a goal of increasing transparency, especially in public communications about policy goals, strategies, and actions. In late 1989, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand rocked the central banking world by introducing inflation targeting. The Bank of Canada and the Bank of England soon followed suit. Two key tenets of inflation targeting are the communication of a clear numerical description of the inflation goal and central bank accountability for achieving that goal. Although the Fed did not, did not formally adopt a version of inflation targeting until 2012, the FOMC took several steps to increase cl clarity and transparency in the 90s and the first decade of the 2000s. Of course, there's importantly issuing policy statements after meetings, expediting the release of the minutes, adding longer run FOMC projections, and increasingly using forward guidance about future policy actions. So this trend towards transparency accelerated dramatically in 2012 with an formal announcement of the 2% longer run inflation goal and, and policy strategy, and for the first time, the publication of FOMC projections of the federal funds rate, the, the famous dot plot. So this combination of the Taylor rule, a new generation of models, and growing transparency spurred RNS research into a range of monetary policy topics and importantly identified new issues to explore. This is a theme that came up earlier. And this has been a two-way process and continues to be one, with new research contributing to the policymakers' thinking on issues and policymakers' interest in greater transparency and inflation targeting and other strategies influencing the questions that the researchers studied. Now, I could think of many, many examples from the past 30 years of how this has come together, uh, with, especially with important contributions from RNS economists, um, but uh, many of whom are in this room. But given the constraints of time, I'm going to talk about three uh, that stand out for me. This is a shorter list than, 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 um, than Jeff showed because it's really just on the monetary policy part. Um, the first is the zero lower bound, or ZLB. And if you think about back to the early 90s or late 90s, the ZLB was viewed as more of a historical curiosity than a rel relevant issue of US, for US monetary policy. But, as I'll mention a paper that uh, was mentioned earlier, in the early 90s, Jeff Fuhrer, building a work he did while in RNS, and Brian Madigan from the Monetary Affairs Division, uh, analyzed the effects of the ZLB on nominal interest rates for different policy rules and inflation targets, kind of bringing these different thing, ideas together in one place. And to me, this is just a groundbreaking paper at the time. It made the simple yet powerful insight that if you follow a policy rule like the Taylor Rule, and a big enough negative shock comes along, the nominal interest rate will be constrained at the lower bound, and that will bring negative effects on output and inflation. Later on, my work with Dave Reichschneider on the ZLB in the late 90s, which culminated in a uh, pr presentation of the FOMC in early 2002, really just was developing these insights further. And of course, there's a lot of work by other economists here on that. And in the subsequent 20 years, when the ZLB went from a theoretical idea for us to a reality, uh, RNS researchers and others made numerous contributions that have helped improve our understanding of the consequences of the ZLB and of the use of alternative tools such as quantitative easing and forward guidance to address those issues. And my second example is the analysis of alternative policy rules and approaches to describing the set of choices and outcomes policymakers face, including analysis of the trade-offs between our goals. Is it, uh, again, a theme that's come up. Alternative scenarios based on different policy strategies have now become the norm uh, at, in terms of Teal Book uh, uh, kind of analysis prepared for the FOMC with a focus on thinking of the me medium term rather than just the short term implications of different policies. And I, I would use one example that I think is really a great example 
of the power and the importance of research on, in this field. And that's a set of papers and analysis, analyses that contribute to the FOMC policy framework review that was announced back in 2018 and completed in 2020 with important contributions from economists and RNS and elsewhere the board. And those papers are all on, on, available on the website. My third and final example is, of course, our star. And I felt uh, the one thing that's, that this morning might have been a little light on. If you think about it, you go back to why, is it, why do we talk about this? Well, it shows up in our models. It shows up in policy rules. It shows up in the analysis we do of even financial markets and the economy. And importantly, it's, an, it's a big driver of the, uh, you know, the, the ZLB. You know, a lower R star means the probability of hitting a lower bound is, is higher. Um, in remarks that I gave at the Thomas Laubach Research Conference back in May, I, I recounted how Thomas and I started working on this to, together on the estimation of R star in, in 2000. And it was really spurred uh, by questions from policymakers and senior leaders of the board thinking through how do we bring, uh, if we're going to think about policy rules, if we're going to think about some of these issues, you know, how do we best uh, estimate or, or assess where R star is. And again, if you're looking, if you, anyone in this room thinks I talk about R star too much, it's Dave and Don who kept like pr pushing us to do this and supporting us. You could have stopped it back then, you didn't. So, you know, you have a lot to answer for. Uh, it continues to be a relevant and timely uh, topic of RNS research and policy analysis to this day. And the fact that there's continued debate and uh, uncertainty about this, I think, reflects the fact that, that you know, the, the research is, is valuable, helping us understand those issues as best as we can. Now, I'll, to, to wrap up, a critical component of any strategy is a focus on the future, and that's very true about monetary policy. 30 years ago, RNS was very much about the here and now, and I would say that's an important part of the role of RNS. But the SAF forecast in the Green Book back then usually extended only through the end of next year. We did get twice a year medium term forecasts of five years, um, but much of the policy analysis that I worked on and others was really kind of mechanical and short term. A typical kind of table would be what would happen if the FOMC increased the funds rate by say 100 basis points for the next year, what would that do to the economy? But that world has changed, changed long ago. Uh, the anal analytical tools we have at our disposal have changed. RNS researchers have not only kept up with those changes, but in many cases have been the first to recognize them and contribute to our understanding of their implications, often well in advance of academic economists. So if you go through a lot of the examples we talk about today, you realize, look at the dates of this research. I think Eileen was making this point uh, about earlier research too. A lot of that cutting edge research was happening here at the Fed before maybe academics came around to, 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 to think of this as an important issue and then obviously add to our under, understanding um, on those. My three examples illustrate this, but there's a lot more examples, obviously, I could draw on. Now, recently, macro models have, their use at central banks, have been um, criticized or even blamed for missing the rapid and sustained rise in inflation that began in 2021. I think there's a couple of important points about that. Models don't make staff forecasts. We heard the use of the word judgment a lot of bringing a lot of analysis to bear beyond any specific mo model. And models definitely don't make policy decisions. That's not their purpose. The purpose of models, whether simple heuristics or multi-country models with hundreds and hundreds of equations, is to help organize, quantify, and communicate our understanding of how the economy works. Any shortcomings in our models reflect shortfalls in our collective understanding rather than the cause of our misunderstanding. It's the job of us as researchers to learn from experience, revise the models we have, improve them, and sometimes build new ones. And in that regard, I think the history of RNS shows that the models and analysis created and refined by generations of RNS researchers has done exactly that. We've added, they've added immensely to our understanding of issues critical to the Federal Reserve's mission, and that goes back as long as I can remember all the way through the pandemic and today. So I'll finish where I started. So I started looking back over the past 30 years. It's remarkable, really remarkable, how dramatically the theory and practice of monetary policy and the work of RNS have jointly evolved. The Fed of 1993 seems far distant from that of today. So 
I'll leave you with this. I wonder if 30 years from now, they, by which I mean the AI robots who will be running everything, <laughs> will look back at our current understanding of monetary policy and the macro economy with some amusement. And I imagine they'll also be wondering how we manage without all the new things that will be developed over the next 30 years. And much of that will be done right here at the board in RNS. Thank you.